Remember the first Gulf War, also called the Persian Gulf War, that included Desert Shield and Desert Storm? The United States has fought so many wars in that region, Americans get confused. This was the war to expel Iraqi troops from Kuwait that is labeled a great war by the American media. There are dark details that official history leaves out. The area now called Kuwait had been part of Iraq until an anti-colonial rebellion forced the British to abandon its Iraq colony. Britain retained control of the oil-rich coastal region by creating the nation of Kuwait in 1961, led by a puppet monarchy. Iraqis rejected this ploy since this coastal area was part of its Basra province for over a century under Ottoman and British rule. Details are linked below. British troops garrisoned Kuwait for several years to deter an Iraqi invasion. The billions of dollars earned from this oil-rich enclave each year flow into British and American banks, with plenty of money left to pamper the locals. Wealthy and arrogant Kuwaitis are hated in the Arab world, since they rarely spend money to help impoverished Arabs. Most work in Kuwait is performed by foreign workers who outnumber citizens three to one. The American Empire was furious when a revolution in Iran produced a government that rejected American control. The United States retaliated by encouraging Iraq Saddam Hussein to invade Iran to seize territory. During the bloody Iraq-Iran War from 1980 to 1988, the Americans sold weapons to both sides. Hussein is seen here meeting with American envoy Donald Rumsfeld in 1983, who arranged loans to fund the war. That war ended in a stalemate, leaving Iraq nearly bankrupt with $80 billion in foreign debt. Saddam Hussein demanded that Saudi Arabia and Kuwait forgive their $30 billion debt, claiming Iraq had defused Iran's threat to Arab nations. The Saudis agreed to reduce it, but Tani Kuwait refused to cancel any Iraq debt. Iraq hoped to repay debts by raising the price of oil through OPEC oil production cuts, but prices fell after Kuwait increased production more than its quota. Iraq deployed troops to the Kuwait border and demanded concessions, but the Kuwaiti dictatorship was confident the British and Americans would protect their investment. Iraq had friendly relations with the United States and sought advice since Iraq was the only Arab nation capable of containing Iran's revolutionary army. American Ambassador April Glasby, shown here, met with Saddam Hussein and told him, quote, We have no opinion on your Arab-Arab conflicts, such as your dispute with Kuwait. Secretary Baker has directed me to emphasize the instruction, first given to Iraq in the 1960s, that the Kuwait issue is not associated with America. End quote. These statements caused Hussein to believe that he had a green light from the United States to invade Kuwait. This exchange only became public nine years later, following a WikiLeaks release of a cable sent by the U.S. Embassy in Iraq. Details are linked below. Global events produced a political climate that was unfortunate for Iraq. The Cold War had ended and the U.S. military machine was seeking new conflicts. American military forces were downsizing and withdrawing from Europe as President Bush talked about a peace dividend. On August 2, 1990, Iraqi forces surged across the border and quickly seized Kuwait. The American media embraced its traditional role as a warmongering propaganda machine that told Americans Iraq was assembling massive forces to invade Saudi Arabia too, which was later proven false. Fake news included blaming Iraq for a 1988 wartime incident where 5,000 Kurds were killed by Iranian gas. An attractive Kuwaiti lady burst into tears in front of Congress telling about Iraqi soldiers tossing babies out of incubators to die on the floor. It was later revealed that she was the daughter of Kuwait's ambassador to the United States, who wasn't in Kuwait during the invasion. President Bush ordered a massive deployment of American forces to Saudi Arabia, called Operation Desert Shield, and assembled an international coalition to free Kuwait. 
American military spending soared, leaving some to speculate that Iraq had been led into a trap. Saddam Hussein insisted on compromise, and talks were held in Egypt, but Kuwait refused to concede anything. Meanwhile, Iraq suffered from complete economic embargoes, and its economy was facing collapse. American Senator Bernie Sanders argued that military action was unnecessary since Iraq was isolated by an international trade embargo and would soon be forced to relent and withdraw from Kuwait. President Bush and his generals had no interest in a peaceful resolution. Once American forces were ready, the United States began a massive air offensive that destroyed much of Iraq and its army. The Allies lost 41 aircraft in these attacks. The Allies had a hundred times more military resources in Iraq, and resistance was futile. Saddam Hussein finally agreed to international demands and publicly ordered his troops to withdraw to Iraq with no conditions. Iraqi convoys filled the main highway to leave Kuwait, as President Bush demanded. American military aircraft slaughtered Iraqis as they were peacefully withdrawing, and what became known as the Highway of Death. Even Iraqis traveling home in civilian automobiles and buses were massacred. The U.S. military was almost ready to begin a huge ground offensive to expel the Iraqi army from Kuwait. But the Iraqis were leaving on their own. As a result, the U.S. military was ordered to attack fleeing Iraqis immediately, but waited another day to issue updated orders. The American army searched forth and found little to engage. Iraqi officers fled, leaving thousands of hungry and demoralized draftees stranded in the desert. Desert Storm was promoted as a great success, but was more like a peacetime live fire exercise where the main threat was from friendly fire accidents. After the war, the U.S. House Armed Services Committee investigated the true number of Iraqi troops facing the Americans. After reviewing U.S. military reports, captured Iraqi documents, and interviews with Iraqi prisoners, they concluded the half million American troops faced only 183,000 Iraqi soldiers during the ground assault, not the 547,000 claimed by the Pentagon. Moreover, Iraq's best units had remained far from the border and never fought. American soldiers were prepared for huge battles to destroy evil forces, but only found hungry Iraqi draftees who just wanted to surrender and go home. The movie Jarhead covers this topic well. President Bush was embarrassed by news video of the aerial slaughter of withdrawing Iraqis and proclaimed victory after a hundred-hour war. He publicly declared a ceasefire to end offensive operations after General Storman Norman Schwarzkopf assured him that remaining Iraqi forces in Kuwait were surrounded and could not escape. Despite the heroic media image, General Schwarzkopf was known as Screaming Norman in the Army. His tirades demanding rapid advancement encouraged his field generals to lie about their forward progress. This seemed harmless until Schwarzkopf assured President Bush that Iraq's fleeing army was trapped in Kuwait. This led to a premature ceasefire that allowed Iraqi units to march home through a 100-mile gap. President Bush and senior army generals were furious. It is unclear who ordered what, but two days after the ceasefire was declared, Major General Barry McCaffrey, a two-star in charge of the 24th Infantry Division, ordered attacks on columns of Iraqi troops peacefully leaving Kuwait. Apache attack helicopters and American armored units launched surprise attacks on Iraqi troops, and this footage was later released to glorify American weaponry. Thousands of Iraqis were slaughtered during this war crime. The Army investigated after complaints from soldiers, but took no action. The Bush administration quickly promoted McCraffy two more grades to a four-star general. Famous reporter Seymour Hirsch wrote a well-researched article about these war crimes that was published in The New Yorker, linked below. But corporate media ignored it. 
Details about Screaming Norman's bungled offensive and this massacre are described in the history book Lucky War, published by the U.S. Army, link below. The euphoria of a victory was quickly smothered by reality. Most of the massive, expensive military deployment was unneeded. A weakened Iraqi military remained intact, while Iran benefited from the pummeling of its main enemy. Much of the Kuwaiti and Iraqi oil industry was heavily damaged, which resulted in sharply higher oil prices for years that caused a worldwide economic recession. Americans were pleased the war did not kill and maim thousands of American soldiers, but that came later. American forces had entered southern Iraq and discovered vast stocks of munitions. Markings showed they were from many of President Bush's coalition, who supplied Iraq with weaponry during its war with Iran. See the video link below. Most embarrassingly, this included American and imported chemical munitions. The U.S. Army was ordered to blow up these munitions and withdraw from Iraq as soon as possible. Army officers expressed concerns that massive explosions would spread deadly chemicals over a wide area, and that is what occurred. Explosions created plumes that rose thousands of feet while winds blew them southward over American soldiers. Chemical alarms warned of danger, but the mild exposure caused no immediate health problems. Years later, American soldiers and veterans began to suffer from mysterious health problems that became known as Gulf War illness. A wide range of acute and chronic symptoms have been linked to very low-level exposures to chemical weapons, to include fatigue, muscle pain, cognitive problems, insomnia, rashes, and diarrhea. Approximately 250,000 of the 697,000 U.S. veterans who served in the 1991 Gulf War are afflicted, and tens of billions of dollars have been spent to treat and compensate suffering Gulf War veterans. The 1991 Gulf War is remembered as a great war. In reality, Worldwide sanctions would have forced Iraq to peacefully withdraw. The Gulf War cost billions of dollars, killed or sickened a million people, left the region much worse off, and caused a worldwide economic recession. The great Congressman Ron Paul correctly summarized this war several years later. In January 1991, we went to war in the Middle East against Saddam Hussein. Iraq's dictator, who was our ally during the Iran-Iraq War. A border dispute between Kuwait and Iraq broke out after our State Department gave a green light to Hussein's, uh, for Hussein's invasion. After Iraq's successful invasion of Kuwait, we reacted with gusto and have been militarily involved in the entire region 6,000 miles from our shore ever since. This has included Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. After 20 years of killing and a couple trillion dollars wasted, not only does the fighting continue with no end in sight, but our leaders threaten to spread our bombs of benevolence on Iran.